Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, boys and girls, men and women, and those who don't identify in any of those categories. Uh, there'll be a little bit about pies today, but it won't mostly be about pies. That's a metaphor. That's a warning. Um, right. There is, indeed, a spectre haunting Europe and, indeed, the rest of the world, but it is not communism, as Marx and Engels wrote in their manifesto, the Communist Manifesto of 1848. It is not communism. It is not even terrorism. It is rather ignorance. It is rather ignorance. Ignorance of the fundamental ideas at the heart of politics, expressed through our institutions, through our policies, through political argument. Ignorance of the ideas at the heart of politics, ignorance of the ideas, the analysis of which is the nature of my subject, today's subject, political philosophy. And it is right to call this ignorance a spectre, or if you're not sure what a spectre is, a ghost. Okay, because the thing about ignorance is to be ignorant of something so often is to be ignorant of your ignorance. You do not notice what you are ignorant of. This is the kernel of truth in Donald Rumsfeld's infamous unknown unknowns. Okay? Like a ghost, we do not see a ghost. Our ignorance, we often do not notice it. And this is true, I think, of political philosophy, a society-wide ignorance of political philosophy. Consider, if you want your hair cut, you go to a hairdresser. If you want your car fixed, you go to a mechanic. If you want your accounts fixed, you go to Panama. Right? <laughs> well, you go to, no, you go to an accountant who goes to Panama. Right? If you want an analysis of political argument, if you want somebody to tell you how politics ought to work, who do you go to? You might get a political journalist telling you about the likely impact of this or that policy. You might get a pollster telling you some information about how people feel about different things. You might get someone from a trade union or an interest group giving you a partisan position. But you wouldn't go to a political philosopher. How could you? You've never heard of political philosophy. And that might be for the best. We are, after all, mostly kooky academics, right? Um, we tend to have our heads wrapped around rather abstract ideas floating up in the sky that seem to have little connection to the real world. But I still think this is a problem. I think this ignorance is a problem. Ignorance of the fundamental ideas at play in politics, ignorance of political philosophy, OK? I think this ignorance costs us. Right? It makes a difference whether or not a society understands, knows about, practices to some extent political philosophy. The way it makes a difference whether or not a society is literate, whether or not a society is literate, affects how it votes, what it votes for, the kind of policies and politicians it gets. Whether or not you educate your population to the age of 12 makes a difference. To the age of 16 makes a difference. The age of 18 makes a difference. To university level makes a difference. It was a truth well recognized in the ancient world, certainly the world of ancient Athens, that when we think about democracy, what matters is not just the rules, krasi, for democracy is demos, people, krasi, rule. What matters is not just the rules of the system, what matters is the people themselves. Who are the people? How educated are they? How enlightened are they? This affects whether you get a Trump or someone who is not a Trump. Right? This affects what kind of policies you get, what kind of politicians you get. Okay? At Bristol, at the moment, we're talking about something called Bristol Futures. Right? We're talking about Bristol Futures, and part of that idea is a talk about citizenship. We're talking about new way of doing Bristol degrees that equip uh, Bristol uh, students to be citizens of a future global world. I would like to think, as part of that, that there is a place for teaching political philosophy students from engineering, computer science, law, economics, equipping them to be the citizens of a future world. Because what could make you a better citizen than an understanding, a keen, fine-nosed, analytic understanding of the ideas at play in politics? Ideas like power, justice, freedom, equality, democracy. Really knowing what form those ideas take, what their implications, entailment, significance, is. Okay, that matters. I like to dream of a future in which we teach at least a little bit of political philosophy in schools, in schools in this country and indeed around the world, as standard, 
right? Equipping the adults and the voters of tomorrow with a more fine-honed understanding of these ideas, it would make a difference, okay? Make a difference to the kind of world we live in, right? At present, the worry about something like that would be, ooh, doesn't that sound a little bit like indoctrination, teaching political philosophy in schools? But when we teach political philosophy, we don't tell you what you ought to think about politics. We show you the ideas, the concepts, the values, the principles, the arguments either side, and then you decide for yourselves. I think this would make a difference to the adults and, as I say, the voters of tomorrow. I find it ironic that we are so comfortable in this country, for example, teaching religious education in schools. We do not think that is indoctrination, but we are wary of teaching political philosophy. That is an irony, and I think it's an irony that costs us. Okay, so political philosophy is about the fundamental ideas at the heart of politics, and the grasp of those ideas we have as a society affects our politics, affects our world. Now, I assume in all of this that you are interested to learn more, then, about this subject, and I assume that based on quite a simple premise. Philosophers often like to work up from quite simple premises deductively. My simple premise is this. I assume if you're here that you're at least a little bit interested in politics. Okay? I assume you're not here because of pies, right? Some of the publicities had the pies and didn't really have the explanation of what the pie is a metaphor for. I assume you're interested in politics, and I assume if you're interested in politics that from time to time you engage in arguments with your friends and your family about politics, about what ought to be done, about EU referendums or budgets or tax returns, right? I assume that you argue about that, and I assume when you argue about that, that you sometimes think, what is at the root of these arguments, such that they are political arguments? What is at the root of these arguments in terms of the positions I keep expressing or enunciating, or my interlocutor expresses or enunciates? What is, what is at the root of all my political positions, such that they are recognisably, say, left-wing or right-wing? And, of course, you wonder about what makes these arguments, where these arguments come from within you, and you probably wonder about whether there are any true or right answers in any of this, whether one political position is ever better than another. Is there any truth to such matters? Is there right or wrong in such matters? I assume all that based on your being here, based on my assumption that if you're here, you care about politics. So with all of that in mind, what I want to do today is just give you a little sort of overview of the subject of political philosophy. And if you come away from that thinking that, yes, it might make a difference if society more generally had a better grasp of this, great. If you have a better understanding, perhaps, of some of the ideas that you're expressing in your political arguments, that's good. But I just want to give you a sense of what the subject involves. Okay? And what the subject involves, at its heart, two questions. Who gets what, and who decides who gets what? Or more shortly, who gets what says who? Or, more precisely, who should get what, and who should decide who gets what in life? Who should get what in life? Who should get all the pies? And who decides who gets all the pies? These are the two core questions, and I'll explain them to you more in detail in a moment. But they've been the core questions for political philosophy for a very long time, and at least as far back as the two people depicted at the heart of this picture, Plato and Aristotle. Plato pointing to the sky, saying there are some wonderful ideas out there that we must contemplate. Aristotle pointing to the ground, saying, no, 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 the truth is down here, more concrete, more real. Okay? Don't be distracted by that. The point is these questions haven't changed, even if the answers and some of the arguments have. Okay? Who should get what in life, and who decides who should get what? Now, what do I mean by this? There's a pie. Okay? Who gets all the good stuff in life? Okay? Beautiful houses, skiing holidays, right? perfect husbands, wives, and partners. Who gets these things? People with wonderful taste, people who are talented skiers, forgiving people, kind people, people with low expectations, right? First-class degrees from Bristol, the brightest, the best, the boldest, okay? High-flying internships, people who get first-class degrees from Bristol, perhaps. Piles and piles of money, who gets piles and piles of money? People who start with a pile of money, perhaps, right? 
Now, I'm not assuming you're interested in all of these things, but most of us are interested in at least some of these things. What I want you to understand in terms of politics and political philosophy is this. These are the things we pursue in the game of life, but the rules of that game are a political choice. Okay? What government provides for us is a political choice. What it bans or prohibits is a political choice. What it incentivizes, what it facilitates, what it subsidizes, political choices. What it means to be a banker or a nurse or a doctor or a teacher, what it means to be an academic or a student, these are political choices. Okay? What you pay in life, what you get in life, political choices. And it's the business of political philosophy to think about those choices, to think about the choices we ought to make with reference to ideas such as power, justice, freedom, equality, and so on. Okay? So we're thinking about what the rules are in life that decide who gets what, and we're thinking about the people that preside over those rules. Politicians, for example, right? Who gets what in life and who decides who gets what? What could be more important? What affects your life more ultimately than the kind of political system you operate in? Let's say you grow up and you've got a talent for what? I don't know, coding apps, right? It makes a difference whether you're born in Bristol or South Sudan, okay? It makes a difference the system you operate in, because the system you operate and the rules it expresses affects the opportunities and the goods available to you, fundamentally, <coughs> okay? So, think about who gets all the pies. We tend to think about people like this, politicians, looking at pies, contemplating pies. I'll have that healthcare pie, that's a nice pie. I won't have that tea party pie, I'll have that healthcare pie. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely, it's a lovely pie. The pies are mnemonic, a mnemonic, right? You just meant to remember today by thinking there was that thing about pies, and the pies were a metaphor for something, right? Google image search let me down here. This isn't really a pie. This looks like a kind of ciabatta with cheese and a bit of rocket or something, right? Which isn't really anything to do with Obama. Cheese and a bit of rocket's probably like a Trump presidency, right? But there we go, there we go. These are, this is what matters in life when we think about the rules of the game and who decides, okay? But how can we argue about this, right? Because we, we think, we, okay, so we let's accept that this matters. How can we argue about this? Or how can we meaningfully argue about this, about, you know, who should get what in life and about who decides, right? How can we argue about that? Because we've had various answers to that question in history, right? Various answers... Ah, that little mouse at the top. Do you see that little arrow? That means there's like a little sort of pause. But if I click, oh, there it works. Now, first answer. First answer. Let's take it away, actually. Let's take it away. Let's take it away. How can we argue about this? That's what I was talking about. How can we argue? How can we meaningfully argue about this? How can there be better or worse answers about this? Because right, these people in this picture are having an argument about politics. They're doing an exercise in political ph philosophy. They're deciding who's going to get what in America for the next 200 years. They're deciding the rules of the game for America, and they're deciding who's going to preside over those rules. Okay, this is the writing of the American Constitution. Okay, in 1787, some of the richest men, and they were all men and some of them were slave owners, decided to write a constitution for America. They weren't asked to write a constitution, they were asked to revise the existing Articles of Confederacy, but they took it upon themselves to write a new constitution for America, to set the rules of the game, right, for the country to come. And they certainly assume, they certainly assume that argument is meaningful here, that if we discuss the fundamental ideas and possible institutions and policies, we'll get somewhere, we'll get somewhere, we'll come up with something good. They're arguing about how to write the constitution, okay? But let's just think more generally about the answers that we could offer to this question of what makes one position in all of this better than another, right? And historically, one of the most influential answers has been this, religion, right? Religion. What makes your position on politics right? Well, it derives from a particular religion. But you, as you might have noticed, that's quite a difficult answer to have in the world, quite a divisive answer. Right? Christians don't agree with Muslims, don't agree with Jews, don't agree with Hindus, Sunni, Shia, Protestant, Catholics, 
right? People are not, you may have noticed, all organized around one religion or one text in the world. And even when they are, they find that looking through that text and thinking, hmm, what does that say about personal independence payments for the disabled? It doesn't say very much, <laughs> right? It doesn't say, no, nothing here, something about a goat, no, nothing, right? So religion doesn't really work for us. We're divided over religion, and religion doesn't have all the answers about quantitative easing and all the other things that vex us, right? So we might say, well, let's settle things with reference to a constitution. That was the hope of these people. When we have an argument about what should be done in America, we decide whether or not uh, what's been proposed is constitutional, right? This is the role of constitutional review in American politics. But that's, again, not a very satisfying answer. I mean, we, we're wary of the thought that a document written so long ago by an elite should decide things like abortion or gun control, right? But even if we were happy with that, we'd still have to be happy with the document itself. For us to settle all our arguments by reference to a constitution, we would have to agree that the constitution was right. And not everybody agrees about that, in the same way that not everybody agrees about a religion. So that won't do the job for us, okay? So then you might say something like this, and a lot of, a lot of people fall for something like this. They say, well, what's right varies according to the culture you're in. You know, what's right for the West is not right for the West. What's right for Britain is not right for the rest of Europe. What's right for England is not right for, for Scotland, right? and so on and so forth, right? Bristol, Bath, okay, right? Different cultures, okay, different cultures. Again, not a very good answer for us, because cultures are not internally agreed. They're not internally homogenous. There are no cultures that everybody's a part of and everybody within that culture agrees about tax, benefits, hospitals, schools, foreign policy. Okay? Cultures are not unified, internally homogenous little blocks that tessellate uh, around one another in the world. Okay? So none of these answers work so far. And then you might think, well, you know, it's just all opinion, isn't it? I just feel this way about the EU referendum, and you just feel that way about Osborne's war on the disabled, okay? We just have different opinions about tax and benefits and institutions and so on. And that's quite a tempting answer, right? In some ways, it's quite a comfortable answer. We don't want them to necessarily be right answers that could be preached down upon us. But we're also a bit wary of the idea that there are no wrong answers in politics. We want to be able to say that a, you know, a Hitler or a Stalin and so on, got something wrong, okay? We want to say that there was something a little bit iffy about them, okay? But then if we think there are some wrong answers, that might shed some light on the possibility that there are right answers. But more troublingly, the, the idea that it's all just opinion won't get us very far, because with some things in life, we can just agree to disagree, right? I, can, I, I like ketchup, let's say, and you like mayonnaise, and over there everybody likes wasabi, right? That's fine, because we can all have different sources, right? In this lovely cosmopolitan world, okay? In politics, we don't always have that option. We can't just agree to disagree. We can't have one set of laws for me, and one set of laws for you, and another set of laws. Our laws are gonna have to be collectively binding. I can't have my own tax policy, my own education system, my own defense policy. It can't be personalized to me. It can't be personalized to you. It's necessarily collective which requires, we hope, something like agreement. But we can't just say, oh, look, we've got differences of opinion. Let's go our own way. We can't go our own way with these things. We can't go our own way in politics like that. OK? So these people hope there's something more. But it certainly can't just be the constitution they're coming up with, right? Then we might say, well, I know how we can deal with this. We disagree, but let's deal with it all democratically. Let's just have a vote, and whatever gets the most votes, that's what we do. And to some extent, that is the most satisfying answer on this screen. Okay? But the problem here is there are so many different kinds of democracy. Right? In addition to what I mentioned earlier, that one population is different from another, right? there are different kinds of democracy. Is your democracy direct? Is it representative? Your electoral system, is it proportional representation? Is it first past the post? These things matter in terms of the politicians you get. And differences between the politicians you get matter hugely in terms of the policies and institutions they adopt, right? So there's not one kind of democracy. There are many kinds of democracy, and they all produce different outcomes, different policies, different decisions about who gets what in life, okay? 
all differences, all differences that matter, all the business of political philosophy. So how can political philosophy help with all of this, right? What, what am I offering to you? Well, we need to think about something that this man came up with. This is Amartya Sen. He's an Indian Nobel Prize winning economist on the side. Mainly he's a political philosopher. You just don't know that about him, but that's what he is, right? This is his book, The Idea of Justice. And in The Idea of Justice, he came up with this idea. Came up with an idea about a flute. Why do I want to talk to you about a flute, right? Why don't, some philosophers, in the ancient world, some people wanted to ban flutes. What, what is it with flutes? No, I don't want to talk about flutes particularly. Right. What political philosophy can do to help with all of this, first of all, is it can illuminate our options. So when you're contemplating something like a budget or a referendum or a national election, you've got choices before you. Political philosophy can help you understand the roots of those choices, the fundamental ideas at play. And part of how it does that is it abstracts from some of the political choices we face, choices about who gets what in life and who decides, with simple, what we call, thought experiments. Thought experiments are not new to political philosophy. They're quite akin to when we have things like parables or allegories, and we talk about the moral of this or that story. But thought experiments are a more precise breed of allegory. Okay? And this is one about a flute. And I want you to think about it. Okay? Here's the flute. There's three children quarrelling over this flute. They're called Anne, Bob, and Carla. Only a political philosopher could think, oh, these children are fighting over the flute, right? They don't want the flute. Flutes are boring, right? That's what my children would probably say. Okay. Anne, Bob, and Carla, and they're quarrelling over a flute, right? This is going to illuminate, I think, something about how we think about politics. Anne says, she's the only one who can play it. She's the talented flautist. She should get the flute. Okay? Bob points out that the other two have lots of toys, whilst he has none. Poor Bob, right? Okay. Carla points out that she provided some of the wood, so she, in effect, owns the flute. Okay? Different claims, different ways of arguing about who gets what in this situation. Who should specifically get the flute? Okay? So who should get the flute? I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this, and then I want you to tell me what you think about this. Okay? So get out your phones or tablets, connect them to Wi-Fi, or connect them to the data network. I'm going to poll you now on who gets the flute. And I don't want you thinking about what I think in terms of who should get the flute. I just want you to decide for yourself who gets the flute. You have a choice between Anne, Bob, and Carla. This is an important flute. Don't get it wrong, OK? Anne says she's the only one who can play it. Talented, special Anne. Bob says the other two have lots of toys, and he hates them, right? Carla provided some of the wood. Bob's out in the lead so far, early voter. Good to see someone with particularly nimble fingers. <gasps> now it's neck and neck between Bob and Carla. Take your time. There's going to be two more votes like this. So keep your phone going, keep it connected, and keep this website open. Go to this website at the top left of the screen. Take your time to type in that website. Give us your vote. And don't be distracted by the boat so far. I don't want bandwagoning effects. Just <laughs> want your feeling about this. Oh, oh God. Well, you're divided, which is good, which is interesting. Oh, but Bob. Oh, you do feel for Bob, don't you? Was it, was it the voice I used to I, I think I think Bob's a bit annoying. He's a bit pleading. Imagine him whining. Mm -hmm. Oh no, Anne. No one has much time for Carla's property claim. Oh, Carla. You're thinking, why did you bother to bring the wood? Bob just sat there all day. You know, Bob wasn't practicing the flute or gathering wood. He just sat there to say, oh, I'm waiting for the flute. I shouldn't try to sway you. I'm sorry. OK. We've still got votes coming in. We've still got votes coming in. 
We've got a, I think we've got a winner though. We've got a winner. Who gets this flute? Who gets this flute? We've got votes. We've got a hubbub of discussion. OK, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop you there now. I'm just going to stop you there now. It's good. Keep the phones or the tablets connected. There will be further votes. OK. What we have here, we have a split. We have a split. We are pulled in at least three different directions by three different kinds of claim about who gets what in life. Three different kinds of claim, the like of which we see every day in politics, in political argument, in discussions about budgets, about benefits, taxes, so on and so forth. OK? Let's break this down. OK? We're thinking about our thoughts. What we do a lot in philosophy and political philosophy, we do thinking about our thinking. We thought about that situation. I now want us to think about the thoughts we had. OK? So, we're abstracting from real life situations to imaginary situations like the choice about the flute. And we're hoping that when we do that, they illuminate something about the real political choices we make, the real judgments we make about parties, policies, institutions, referendums. OK? We hope that contemplating thought experiments like this help us to see the roots, as I say here, of some of our problems. Right. I mean, in the case of the flute, right, when we're wondering about what the right thing to do, maybe the just thing to do, the fair thing to do, David Cameron always talks about, it's the right thing to do. I did what I did because it was the right thing to do. Right. We are pulled by at least three different things in the case of Anne, Bob, and Carla. In the case of Anne, there is a claim of desert. Anne is claiming she deserves the flute in virtue of her talent or skill. Bob is claiming that he needs the flute in virtue of his relative toy poverty. Okay? Carla is claiming that she is entitled to the flute in virtue of the goods she provided for the flute maker, who is out of the picture somehow, the mysterious flute maker. Okay? Desert, need, and entitlement. One of the things I want you to take away from here today is to think about your own thinking and the judgments of justice and about who gets what. What's going on in your thoughts? Do you tend to be moved by desert, need, or entitlement? OK. Now, let's think more about those three ideas, just as an illustration of how political philosophy can illuminate our dilemmas, our choices, our conflicts. OK, this is a house. This is a real house in Bristol. It's the kind of house I would have loved to live in as a student, right? It's had a neo-Gothic exterior redesign. Uh, these days, I'm much more boring. And I think, well, that's a new roof. That won't need to be redone for about 20, 25 years. But there's some really crazy guttering above the bay window. But it's a really exciting neo-Gothic house. Right? And we can think about things like houses. And we think, who gets houses? Who gets this house? Right? Somebody who deserves the house, somebody who needs the house, somebody who's entitled to the house. OK, hold that in mind. But let's think still more about these ideas, need, desert, entitlement, and how we employ them and rely on them when we're making judgments and having arguments. Think, for example, about something like education. And if I said to my students, OK, in deciding who gets the grades in this course, uh, I'm going to give the highest grades to the people who give me the most money, right? You'd be pretty appalled by that, I like to think, unless you've got lots of money. Right? If I said, I'm going to distribute grades according to entitlement, you'd be appalled by that. Right? We generally think that the people who get the highest grades should be the people who came up with the best essays or exams, the people who deserve, therefore, the best grades. And similarly, if I said, well, I'm going to give a really good grade to this person because all their other grades were terrible and they need it, okay? <laughs> you might think, well, you know, warm-hearted but wrong, okay? <laughs> grades go to the people who deserve them, okay? Healthcare, we don't tend to rely upon dessert. We tend to rely upon need. We generally think in healthcare that health resources and care go to the people who need. We don't think, oh, you can have that dialysis machine and you have that liver transplant, regardless of your diabetic condition or not, or your liver, right? We tend to think these should be distributed to the people who need these particular healthcare resources, right? And we sometimes have other ideas creep in with health. We certainly know people can buy 
healthcare, so they're therefore entitled to different standards of healthcare. And we sometimes have, particularly Radio 4 discussions and the like, dessert sometimes creeps in. There was a surgeon on the, the radio the other day and they were talking initially about whether some people deserve certain kinds of healthcare if they've ruined their health through, you know, booze or drugs or cigarettes. And the surgeon came on and said, well, actually, I've got a problem with skiers. Right, because people go on skiing holidays, bloody skiing holidays, and they always do their knees in, and these are expensive operations. So people who ski shouldn't get healthcare, right? <laughs> Tantamount, we said. We don't. This sometimes creeps in. We think people deserve more or less in virtue of their lifestyle, but generally we think need when it comes to healthcare. And with housing, what we tend to practice, at least in this country and many countries, is entitlement. The person who gets this house is the person who is prepared to pay the most to buy it or the most to rent it. The person who gets the house is the person who's entitled to the house. But of course, if it was something like uh, a council house, if it was a piece of social housing, we might have other ideas, right? I was in a discussion the other day with a kitchen fitter, right? And the kitchen fitter was talking about social housing. He says, I don't think the social housing should go to refugees. I think the social housing should go to soldiers who've come home from Iraq, OK? What he was doing there was making a claim about desert rather than need. Right? The refugees might be poorer, more desperate, they might need the house, but the servicemen and women, they deserve the house because they've done something special. And you, can, you see that idea sometimes played out with, with, with social housing, you know, the, the, the key workers like, like, like fire, firemen and women or, or, or nurses or doctors, not so much doctors, they've got quite a bit of money, right? but they should get housing because they deserve it in virtue of what they're doing. They deserve it. Right? And again, with need, we sometimes argue, well, who's most in need? Is it the desperate refugee? Is it somebody who has a particular disability? Even with social housing, we sometimes talk about entitlement. Are you more entitled to a council house or from a council house if you are a British citizen? Does that make you more entitled than someone who is not a British citizen? So these ideas are always being employed and used in terms of deciding who gets what. Need, desert, entitlement. And if you realize that, you can start to think about them. Think about, well, who is the most needy? Who is the most deserving? Who is the most entitled? And are those ideas, need, desert, entitlement, stable when we scrutinize them? When we think about the most deserving, who is the most deserving? Who works the most hours? Who works the hardest job? Who has the rarest skill? The translator of Old Norse, perchance? Right? We can start to analyse these ideas, we can start to understand the way we evaluate politics, and in time we might change the way we think about politics as we start to identify, illuminate and analyse the ideas at the heart of our judgments about who gets what. Okay? Benefit and tax reform always brings in these ideas. Every budget there's a wrangling about need, desert and entitlement. Okay? always coming up. People might not be using these terms, but they are relying upon them. Okay? Now, we talked about illumination. Now I want to hazard the possibility that sometimes political philosophy can solve some of the questions. Not my job, of course, to indoctrinate you, to tell you what you ought to think about who gets what and who decides, but I will present you an argument and make of it what you will. Right? Because political philosophy also tries to solve some of the political choices we face in terms of who gets what and who decides. So look at this pond. It's a fairly lovely pond, a bit of paving, a bit of plants, some fish. That's not got anything to do with a thought experiment. Think about the following scenario. You're walking along and you see a child drowning in a pond. <gasps> Terrible, isn't it? Child drowning in a pond. You know that if you jump in straight away, you can save the child, but... Your new iPhone, which is pretty damn nice, right, will be broken in the process. You can save the child, the child is drowning, your iPhone will be kaput again. Should you save the child, what would you do? <laughs> it's said on the oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece, know thyself. We will know you now, people. Leave them to drown. <laughs> Very touching. It's a fairly upstanding audience. Yes. I want honest answers, though. Right? Yeah, honest answers. Of course, as I often think with this, right, 
you probably haven't seen the child because you're just looking at your phone, right? But let's say you've seen the child. You're maybe taking a picture of them and you notice them. <laughs> As they Instagrammed their drowning, right? 94%, 6%. Sometimes it's quite fun with this when you realize the last person voting and you see the numbers shift and you know. You just know what they did. OK, let's leave it at that. Almost all of you, not quite all of you, save the child. 5% of you, maybe you're contrarians, maybe you're rebels, maybe you really like your phone. Right, and I, I, I think it's the latter. OK, let's think about that. For those of you, which is most of you, who would have saved a child, here's another choice. Here's another choice that I want you to think about. Instead of buying that phone in the first place, would you spend £250, which is less than, say, an iPhone 6? I've checked this, right? Would you save £250 on saving the life of a child in the developing world? OK, I've checked that figure too. Here's a way you can check what it costs to save an individual life. Would you not buy the phone in the first place in order to save the distant, dying child who is dying as surely as the child in the pond in front of you? Let's know ourselves again. Don't look for what you, know, you think I think is the right answer. Just A hush as the truth unfolds before our eyes. Eighty twenty. Not quite the same <laughs> figures as we had first time. Still a bit of voting going on. Still a bit of voting going on. Oh, it, it is it is rising. The people who thought about it longest seem to think, oh well, I'll save the child. The child's probably dead by then. You know. <laughs> That was crueler than I meant it to sound. <laughs> you haven't killed any children, you've just voted. OK, three quarters to a quarter. But the reverse, the reverse sentiment. OK, the reverse sentiment. And that's interesting. OK, that's interesting. Because for some people, like the philosopher Peter Singer, the two situations are identical. In both cases, you have the chance to save a life, right? The cost is the same, but your decision is different. Do you want to say that if the child is another meter away, they are not worth saving? 10 meters away, 50 meters, 100, a kilometer, 100 kilometers, 1,000 miles, 10,000 miles. Is distance making that much of a difference? Is there something else going on? When you wonder about this, notice something. When you argue about, if you want to say, no, the situations are different, in making that argument, you are, again, doing political philosophy. You say, there's something different about these situations. Or you might realize, in your heart of hearts, your mind of minds, your soul of souls, the situations are the same, and you need to change your mind about what you do with your money. That's another possibility, OK? My job is simply to illuminate give you these choices. It is for you to think about your thinking and examine your convictions. OK? Here's a final question. I won't poll you on it. Here's a final question. OK, final question for you to think about, to go away and think about. Think about yourself, right? If you did not know how rich you were or how rich you're likely to be, if you do not know your sex, if you do not know your gender, if you do not know your race or your talents, if you do not know generally what you want to do in life, if you do not know your age, what rules would you choose to govern a political system? What rules would you choose that decide who gets what and also decide who will be overseeing those rules and making further decisions? OK? Why do I ask you that? This is a thought experiment created by John Rawls and articulated in a book called The Theory of Justice came out in 1971. It was the most influential book in the 20th century when it comes to political philosophy. And the hope of it is, when you ask yourselves this question, people who otherwise have different political convictions 
end up coming to the same answer. When they are rendered sufficiently impartial by forgetting their wealth and their wants and their sex and their race, they start to come up with the same vision. Their political thoughts are harmonized, are unified, are aligned in virtue of that abstraction, in virtue of forgetting the things that sometimes corrupt their political judgments, their interests, their status, their class, their position. Okay? You can ask yourselves then, in terms of how optimistic you are about human nature, if we were all impartial like that, and we all asked ourselves that question, would we all agree? Could we bring some harmony to our disagreements about politics at the level of budgets and referendums and so on, if we were philosophical in that sense? Okay? Are there patterns to your thinking? When you do this thinking about thinking, when you consult what's going on in the judgments you make about who gets what and who decides, are there things underpinning those judgments that you haven't noticed before? Maybe ideas of need, desert, or entitlement. Maybe deep-lying principles you haven't noticed before. Maybe all of your thoughts, and some philosophers think this, correspond to what's sometimes called the golden rule of morality, common to so many systems, only treat others as you would yourself like to be treated. If that's the case, do you subscribe to the more positive idea, do to others as you would like done to yourself, help others as you would like to be helped, or the more limited idea, do not do to others that which you would not like done unto yourself? <coughs> Just that difference could be the key difference in explaining why you are left-wing or right-wing, why you prefer a state that helps people to be all it can be, or a state that simply keeps people out of one another's way. Okay? The hope for so much political philosophy is that when you consult your own thinking, the roots of your thinking, you will see these things that you had not seen before, and maybe in time change your mind. And maybe it's a naive hope, but it's a hope that my son has. Right? My son is five, but when he was three, he would start to ask all sorts of moral questions, and not because I'm brainwashing him, right? but because that happens at that age. And nursery, so many kids go to nursery now, and nurseries are hothouses of morality, and they come back with all these rules, and mostly they come home and they say, sharing is caring. Right? <laughs> That's the one that generally, kids are really good at adopting rules and not sticking to them. They, they snatch from one another and go, sharing is caring. Right? <laughs> like this. It's quite corrupt. But this day, he said, um, he sat in the back of the car and I was driving home and he said, we mustn't pinch, must we, Daddy? I said, no, 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 we, we, we mustn't pinch. And first we had a little side story where I said, did somebody pinch you today? And he said, yeah, he said yes. And I said, was it Freya? I said, yes, it was Freya. Because right? at nurseries they never tell you, but you can just ask a child, and he's Freya. Right? <laughs> but anyway, he said, he mustn't pinch. I said, mustn't pinch, no, we mustn't pinch. And he said, but we can pinch trees. I thought, ah... Uh, <laughs> Years in philosophy, but yes, you're right, I think, we can pinch trees. Uh, and he said, because, because trees don't have a face, right? Because trees don't have a face. And I thought that was great. What he was doing was thinking about the rule, thinking about what underpins the rule, and thinking about what underpins what underpins the rule. He's thinking, well, how do I, what defines what you can pinch and not pinch, right? And the face was something like a proxy for a mind, perhaps the capacity for pain, right? He was doing philosophy there. He was thinking about what's going on, what's underpinning his thoughts. He was coming to know himself as someone who expresses judgments of right and wrong. Okay? So I just want you to think, you know, I would have some hope that when you consult your own thoughts, you will start to, to discover this. And if you think that, hopefully you'll have a sense that a society that does at least a little bit of political philosophy might be a different society perhaps a better society. Hopefully you have a sense that the more people who do something like this, the more people will at the very least know themselves, but perhaps also change themselves. Okay, so that's the note, the optimistic note guided by my son that I leave you on. Other than that, I will simply leave you with a little bit of further reading, which is not my own book, which I'd love to push upon you, but I can't because it's too boring, right? But here are two books for people who'd like to know more about what I've talked about. Cecile Farber's book, her book on justice in the changing world, very good. Adam Swift's book, Political Philosophy for Beginners and Politicians, who are, of course, often beginners, right? Further reading for you. But that is all I leave you with. I don't want to overwhelm you, but thank you very much for coming, okay? Thank you.